Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I can. All right, so first I want to talk about uh, exam three. So let me share my screen with you guys. Uh, the first thing is uh, on the syllabus, it says supposed to be on Monday, April 5th today, but obviously that's not the case. And I'm thinking of pushing this exam three back in two weeks. So I'm thinking of reschedule that. The two choices I'm thinking of, what are on, um, Friday, April, oh, I see uh, somebody, can we not talk about the quiz because Uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about the quiz, and uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. So I won't talk much about the quiz. I just want to talk about the exam. So one thing is about uh, April. Uh, one choice for exam three is about um, April. Um, I think is sixteenth. Another option is on Monday, April 19. So which date you guys prefer? I'm kind of unflexible. You guys prefer doing that on a Friday or doing that on a, a Monday? Mm. Any comments from you guys? One person says Friday, two Friday. Friday, okay. So it sounds like Friday, right? So let's, let's do this. So I will schedule that on Friday. <clears throat> So we get this done, okay. Another thing I want to talk about is a a question from a student, okay. So let me just make this one a zoom in a little bit. So there's a question about the problem is like. Um, Given a function f of x is equal to x minus 4 raised to the ninth power times x squared minus 16 raised to the sixth power, find the zeros for this uh, uh, polynomial and the, the multiplicity. Okay, So I think for this one here, this is kind of tricky. Actually, you, you have to rewrite this f of x first. You know, the, this one x minus 4 raised to the uh, ninth power, that's fine, leave that there. But x squared minus 16, that's going to be equal to x minus 4 times x plus 4. I mean, the second part, right? So this is 6 power. And if you distribute this, so the first factor stays the same, the bracket, every term inside that bracket will be raised to a 6 power. So you get x minus four raised to the sixth power times x plus four raised to the sixth power. Now, if you combine these two together and you can see these two, they have the same base. So that's equal to x minus four raised to the 15th power times x plus four to the sixth power. So that tells us you have one zero, x is equal to four. So the multiple list, they will be equal to 15. So it's not, it's not nine. And the other uh, zero is negative four, the multiplicity is six. So it's tricky parties right there. The problem we're trying to 
um, you know, confuse you guys here. Okay, so that's this question is about. Not with this. Any other questions? I think the result. Briefly, I can talk about the quiz. I just look at uh, from 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 affinity. The average score is was not that great. It's only about like what nine? It's about ten out of twenty. So missed half of that one. Okay. So uh, we still have like one or two students are going to make it up. So I will talk about that maybe on Wednesday about this. Okay. Um, we're going to continue talk about the rational functions. So for the rational functions, last um, last Friday, we talk about uh, a rational function. Basically, uh, it's just like into this form f of x is equal to a polynomial p of x over another polynomial q of x, and so your p and the q they are polynomials. Okay. And for rational functions, so this is a rational function. For a rational function, the graph of a rational function, one thing is kind of tricky, is very complicated, is the so-called asymptote. And you have like three types, something called vertical asymptotes. It may exist, it may not exist, okay, it depends. It may have something called a horizontal asymptote, and it may have some slant asymptote, okay, so we talk about those three things um, briefly last time, okay. And the one more thing is kind of tricky is when we're talking about, I think we were in the middle of talking about the vertical asymptote, so, so we were talking about the vertical asymptote. And we know from the book, it says, if you try to find the vertical asymptotes of a given rational function, you want to look for the denominator, find out those things that are going to make the denominator to be equal to zero. So uh, if, I, if, you, if I can bring up you know, what we had last time, uh, how to find the vertical asymptote, there are a couple of um, problems, okay? So let me just show you some of the problems. So if one example, if I, I did number 12, how to find the vertical asymptote? So maybe then let me do another one. Um, so I'm going to do number 16. So let me just copy and paste that problem right here so so we are given a rational function so what we want to find is find the vertical asymptotes Let's, i just write vertical asymptotes of l and for this one and you need to focus on when you try to find the vertical asymptotes, you're going to look at the denominator. So in this case, and for this one, you'll try your best to factor this out. So this can be factored as x times x squared plus 9x plus um, 14. On the top, you have x squared minus 1. And you can keep factoring this. This one can be further factored as x minus one on the top, x plus one on the top. Then you have x times x plus two times x plus seven. So the denominator is equal to this, the product of the three. So in order to find the vertical asymptotes, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to set this this denominator to be equal to zero so what i have is one is x equal to zero or x equal to negative two 
or x equal to negative seven. So I have these three vertical lines. So, so what is x equal to zero? Basically, x equal to zero will be x equal to zero. That will be the y axis. X equal to negative two. So that's this will be the line x equal to negative two. The other one is x equal to zero. And also the third one will be x equal to negative seven. And we can have x equal to negative seven. That's the three vertical lines. And this is the second step. We're going to do the factoring, um, look at the denominator, set the denominator to be, to be equal to zero. We'll get these three solutions. And now next we check and we see this denominator has these three factors. Long of these three factors is going to be a factor for the numerator. Okay. Uh, another thing is we find uh, x or x plus two or x plus seven. None of them is a factor uh, for the for the numerator. Numerate. So according to our book, basically this saying, uh, these three factors, that is not a common factor for the numerator and the thing at the bottom. So if that is the case, so we can conclude with I just boxed this guy x equal to zero, x equal to negative two, and x equal to minus seven, they are the vertical asymptote. So this is a procedure for finding that. And by the way, pay attention to this. Why we want to double check this? Why we want to make sure uh, you don't have any common factors for the numerator and the thing at the bottom. Okay, so here's another case. That's why we want, I want to talk about this one, second one. Here is so-called, there's something called removable discontinuity, okay? so. A removable discontinuity. Okay, I'm going to give you the an example first. Then I will explain that. So we have let's take a look of this function f of x is equal to x uh, squared minus one over x plus one. Okay. And what does this graph look like? Well, if you look at this function, this is this function as x minus one on the top, x plus one at the bottom, divided by x plus one. What will be the domain for this function? The domain for this function, and we can see you don't, you cannot allow x to be equal to negative one because if, if, if that is the case, then the denominator will be equal to zero. So the domain for this function is x is not equal to negative one. So when x is not equal to negative one, so this one you, you can actually can be canceled out. You can see x plus one, x plus one on the top and the bottom, you have a common factor. So this function actually is the same as x minus one. If x equal to minus one, then it is not defined if x equal to negative one because the denominator is equal to zero. So when you plot the graph, what you see here is just pretty much the same as a line x minus one. So that will be the graph of this function. However, this thing is not defined at x equal to negative one. That means when x equal to negative one, when x equal to negative one. So the function has a hole here. So the line has a hole here. So actually, you, you cannot allow x to be equal to negative one. That means you do have a hole on this line, okay? So what you have here is, you cannot draw this graph, x squared minus one over x plus one, because if you want to draw this thing here, so you're going to start with from, when go you draw this line, then somehow you have a hole you have to lift up. You cannot draw this line without lifting your pen, right? So you have to lift your pen because this the whole x is not allowed to be equal to negative one. Then you go, you draw the rest of that. 
So in this case, what we we're saying is you have the graph has a discontinuity. At x equal to negative one, and it turns out this this whole you can fix that because you can redefine this function. This uh, this whole actually you can come up with a different function and attach this one here. So you, you can this hole is on the line. So this one is called removable. Okay. So, so whenever you have this kind of case, you have a hole on the underlying graph or line that will be called a removable discontinuity. I just didn't understand. This is the concept in calculus. Okay. So this one is a something in calculus. Okay. or jargon or a terminology, something used uh, from calculus. I don't know why the book put it here, but the case it want to show you is for this function, you don't have, there's no vertical asymptote. at x equal to negative one. Instead, we have a removable discontinuity, so-called. We have a hole there, okay. So that is the reason the thing we observe that is x plus one is a common factor. So the reason is x plus one is a common factor. of the numerator and the denominator. In that case, you don't get a vertical asymptote. So that's why here, whenever you want to find the vertical asymptotes, once you have set the denominator to be equal to zero, you always want to double check those factors which you have, they are not at the same time, not a factor for, for the numerator. In, the, in that case, you have vertical, vertical asymptotes. Otherwise, you have this so-called removable discontinuity. So this kind of uh, something you have to pay attention to. So what about the other two, as, two asymptotes? Horizontal asymptotes and slant asymptotes. So, um, I want to go with the book because in the past, I didn't go with this one. This one is not good. I really don't like the way this just tell you to memorize something. It does not tell you why. Okay. But let's just go with this here. So, uh, if you are given a rational function, right? How do you know, how do you find the vertical asymptotes or the slant asymptotes? So all you need to do, you know, because you have a rational function this this definition just tells you because you have a rational function you always have a polynomial on the top you call p of x you have a polynomial at the bottom you call that q of x so you need to look at the degrees of the numerator p and degrees of q okay the first case if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator so you do have a horizontal asymptote cut of y is equal to zero. That's the first case. And if the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator by one, you don't have any horizontal asymptote exactly by one. Then you have something called slant asymptote. We talked about that before. So the difference between those two degrees should be exactly equal to one. Okay. If the difference you know, if the degree of the numerator is more than one of the degrees of the denominator, you don't have any slant asymptote, you don't have any horizontal asymptote at all. Okay. Now this lifts the group with the third case. When the degrees of these two functions, P of X and Q of X are the same, how do you find the horizontal asymptote of F? So you just take the ratio of the leading coefficients of these two, then you will get that. So it's kind of like 
um, sounds or looks pretty complicated, but it's pretty simple. Let's just look at the key, look at some of the problems, just following this way, okay? Now I'll brief talk about why this one will work, okay? So that's why. So let's take a look of number 10, okay? Uh, we're going to skip the first part. We're not going to do the domain. Vertical asymptotes, we did that, so we're not going to do this. We're going to do the horizontal or slant asymptote for this function. So now for number 10. Your f of x is given by 4 over x minus 1. So look at the degree of the numerator 4. The degree is 0. And the degree of the denominator, x minus 1, which is equal to 1. So you see the degree on the top is less than this. So that goes to the uh, first the case. In this case, automatically you have a horizontal, I call that h dot a, horizontal asymptotes. Okay? There will be a line y equal to 0. Okay? And the, the reason why we have this case is here one way you think about the horizontal asymptotes, what's the definition of that? The horizontal asymptote is basically horizontal asymptote. We mentioned that before. You're going to check what happens uh, when x goes to positive infinity or x goes to negative infinity. See how will your y change? How will your f behave, right? So if you look at this function here, so for one example, x gets really large. So four over x minus one. Think about your x becomes really big, like a minion, right? Say if you think about x is like, like a minion, four over a minion minus one. So the denominator is huge. Divided Four divided by that one, you'll get a very small number. Positive number, right? So, and the, you can see if the number x gets even larger, say 10 to the 11th, 12th power. So the ratio of that will gets to even smaller, right? So it's kind of, a, you have like a smaller and smaller numbers they're getting to zero. So that's why you kind of, you feel like your y equal to f of x in this case, will go to zero. That's the reason, that's why when this one you know, goes to zero, you have a horizontal asymptote. So this is also part of the concept from calculus, okay? So I just don't want to emphasize too much on this. We just, visually we know, we know what this means, okay? Uh, let's do uh, another one. So we have, do we have anything else? And then maybe that's just, let me give you another example. Um, we have a function f of x, which is equal to 6x uh, cubed over 10x minus um, 2x cubed plus 5x squared. Mm -hmm. So how do we find the horizontal asymptote? Again, according to this rule, this thing boxed here. So what we need to do is we check the degree. So what's the degree of the numerator? So the degree of the numerator, which is equal to x to thir thir three, and the degree of the denominator here is just equal to also three. So when you have two degrees are the same, it goes to the third case, you have equal degrees. So the horizontal asymptote is at the ratio of the leading coefficient. So the leading coefficient of this thing on top is six. Um, the leading coefficient at the doom, uh, for this denominator is a two. So you have y is equal to six over two, which is equal to three is and a horizontal asymptote. So that's how we solve for this one. The way you can think about that is again, according to the definition. So you try to see what happens when X goes to infinity. When X goes to infinity, X gets really large. Why do we only concede the leading term? Because when X gets large, uh, 
just between these two terms, you, you have 6x cubed dominates. Uh, this 10 to the x comparing to 6x cubed, it's relatively small, doesn't matter, right? If, if you think about your x is equal to 1,000, you cube with that, you get 10 to the ninth power, but you, you subtract the 10 times the sum, it's just comparing to the huge number, this doesn't matter. So that's why I always think of the dominant terms. So 6x cubed, the leading term dominates on the top. Similarly, in the bottom, 2x cubed um, plus 5x squared. So you see the power here is higher, and again, 2x cubed dominates. So when you have this thing dominates, so you know your uh, rational function, when x gets really big, it behaves like, it doesn't matter you have like 10x or not, it doesn't matter you add five, 5x squared or not. So that's why this behaves, now you can cancel that. You get a y is approaching three. And the similarly, you can do what happens when x goes to negative infinity. So that's the reason why this thing will work. The book, just didn't tell you that. Okay, so other college algebra book explains, in my opinion, much better than this. But we can just go with this. Okay. Um, we have a case for horizontal asymptote equal to zero, horizontal asymptote equal to the lead, the ratio of the leading coefficients when you have the two degrees are the same. So now let's do a third case you have a slant asymptote. So this guy here, you have h of x, which is equal to x squared minus 4x plus 1 over on x plus 2. So in this case, and we can see the degree for the numerator, which is equal to 2, and the degree of the denominator, which is equal to 1. So you see the difference? The numerator, the degree of the numerator is exactly one more than the degree of the denominator. So in this case, you do have a slant asymptote. So how will we find a slant asymptote in this case? Now we're going to do the long division. We get the quotient. Okay, so that's what you want to do. So you, you take x squared minus 4x plus 1. You do long division or synthetic division, doesn't matter. You do just get the quotient. You do the division here, you can put x and x squared plus 2x and minus 6x plus 1, then minus 6, and you have minus 6 minus 12, and you have 13. So that one can be actually written as uh, x minus 6 um, plus 13 over x plus 2. And once you have this, and that, that can explain why it has a slant asymptote, because when x gets really big, th this term, the remainder, 13 over x plus 2, it's got really small. So the dominant term will be x minus 6. So that's why uh, when we have the quotient here, uh, here, so that tells you um, the line y equal to x minus 6 is the slant asymptote. So I can just um, show you, just draw the graph and then show you that. Okay. So then I'm going to share my second screen with you guys. So you can use um, Desmos or somehow you can use the GeoGebra. I, which is the one I talked about uh, last time. Okay. So the example what I had here is y is equal to x squared on the top. I would like to put parentheses around um, minus, um, is that minus? Yeah, minus 4x plus 1. They're all divided by x plus two. And you see that's the graph. This is the graph. And you see you don't have any horizontal asymptote because in this case, 
the degree on the top is greater than the degree at the bottom. Okay. But you do have like a slant asymptote. It looks like this one here is just getting very really close to that line. So I'm going to just type that in another one. So what we, what we just did is a y equal to x minus 6. And you see that the blue line. Okay, so and and when x is small, the difference, the distance between the green curve, the rational function, and the line is kind of big. But however, when x gets large, right, and you can see when x gets large, and actually you cannot really tell which one is on the green curve or on the blue line. Okay, so actually, so that tells us so. This is the meaning of the slant asymptote. Slant asymptote. All right. Um, go back to the OneNote screen. Any questions? Finding you need to know how to find vertical, horizontal slant asymptotes. Okay, horizontal asymptote. We talked about this one right here, just based on this. And the vertical asymptote or removable discontinuity is all based on, you look at the, the factorization of the denominator, okay? All right, so what's the next? So those are just some exercises, right? Okay, so now this uh, one, I just did that, so I'm going to skip this find the slant asymptote, uh, maybe which one? Well, the only, the thing is, you know, if it doesn't matter which one we're going to do, say for example, if you want to do number 32, okay? So you just check for all those functions, the degree of the numerator is exactly one more than the degree at the bottom. So if that is the case, you know there's a slant asymptote, do the long division, get the quotient, that will be it. Now, another type of problem is we, now we know uh, a lot about the rational functions, about the domain intercepts and the, the vertical or horizontal asymptotes. Now, based, now, before we're going to sketch the graph of a given rational function, we want to see going kind of the backwards way, okay? Instead of giving you a function, let's just sketch the graph we go like, I will give you the graph. Can you write down uh, the corresponding rational function? That's, I think sometimes might be harder or sometimes, you know, than just sketch this, right? Okay, so let's take a look. Um, I want to do one, pro one of those two, um, five problems first, then I will ex explain I copy this kind of like thing from our text, but what it meant, okay? So let's just take a look. So in all these type of problems, and you're just given the graph of some rational functions, and we try to come up with a guess of the given function, okay? So let's take a look of, I think, maybe 64. So it's kind of like you are given the picture or the profile of some suspect or something, and you try to do some analysis. You try to get information about what does this person look like, what might be the origin, figure out as more information of that person as you can, right? Okay, so you're trying to solve the puzzle just like that. So this, let's just look at number 64, you're given the profile of this. First, you want to observe, you want to study this thing, what you get from here. So the key things you want to look at is kind of like when you look at the picture of some persons, you want to focus on, hey, uh, the, the, the color of the hair, the color of the eyes, the color of the skin, you know, the look, the appearance, so on and so forth. You want to figure out the key things, okay? So look to me, I think, you want to always focus on x, y intercepts. That's kind of things you want to focus on. You want to look at asymptotes. That will tell you a lot of things. 
Those are the characteristics that will separate one rational function to another one, okay? And maybe you look at where the function is positive, where it's positive or negative. So now I'm going to ask you guys, so what you observed from this graph. So I just count number 64, right? Uh, maybe just copy that down here again, so since I wrote them. All right, now, did you see any x, y intercepts? Well, the x intercept, I've observed this one here. So you get x equal to two. And also the behavior of this thing here is just like x minus two square or to the fourth, right? So it's just kind of like a that parabola, but at least I see this uh, x intercept. I guess that's the only one. That's the only one except that. But what about a y intercept? I probably I see something like that, and I do. I'm not sure what that y value is, but it looks to me. My guess is y is equal to a half. So that means when x equal to zero, your y is equal to half. In this case here, that means when you plug in two for x, you have y to be equal to zero. Okay. Uh, do I see any vertical asymptotes? I see two red dashed line, right? So you see this guy here is y is equal to four. That's a vert, uh, x is equal to four vertical asymptotes. Another one is x is equal to negative two. Okay. Um, that's just two vertical asymptotes. Okay. Do I see any horizontal asymptotes? Hello? Did anybody see y equals zero? Y equals to zero, very good. So when you try to look at the horizontal asymptote, you try to look at when x gets large. So it's kind of like you try to say when x gets large, it looks to me this one we're approaching getting really close to the x-axis, right? Or also, you also need to look when x gets really large negative. So you can see the trend, this thing goes. So that's why you feel like the, the x axis basically that's what you said y is equal to zero that's that's the horizontal asymptote yeah. now any slant asymptote it doesn't look like we have one right there so i this is what i get so far from studying this thing right so i'm going to think about okay how am I going to get the x intercept? I think we did that before. If I just, if you allow me to just go back to last of Friday's um, notes, we have some things. Uh, how do we find, see this guy here? Those are some of the examples of the rational function. How do I find x and the y intercepts, right? Typically, if I want to find x intercept, I'm if you look at number 24, what we did. So you want to set your f of x to be equal to zero. So that means when you try to solve for x intercept, you want to make sure the numerator to be equal to zero, right? Okay. So the numerator is equal to zero. This is how you get the x intercept. And again, and so once you have x intercept, that means you have a root for the numerator. That means you have some factors for the for the numerator. So this is what we have. So based on this, so I would say the x-intercept 
tells you some information. Tells the info for the numerator. And also this info actually means the factors, right? That's how you get X intercept. Also, look at this vertical asymptotes. We just talked about, right? How do I find out the vertical asymptotes? I'm setting the denominator to be equal to zero. So this vertical asymptotes, we know this tells the info, actually the factors. For, for the denominator, right? So we can write this down first. First, I have one, uh, all those problems you want to write an equation. So let's go to here, x equal to two. So that tells me my function will look like x minus two. You got to have some factor x minus two on the top. I have no idea what that exponent is. So I'm leaving a box here, a blank or box there. And this guy, you have x equal to four. Four is the root that tells me minus four is, x minus four is a factor, right? And x equal to negative two, that tells me x plus two is also a factor. And again, I do not know what will be the exponents for those two, but that will go to the bottom, right? We'll go to the bottom, right? So now the third thing, what about the horizontal asymptote? When you have a horizontal asymptote, it's equal to zero. I think from that big box we had in the previous page, when you try to find, oh, whoops, where did it go? Oh, uh, it's right there. The horizontal, horizontal asymptote is when you have zero, y equal to zero as the horizontal asymptote. That means the degree of the numerator should be less than the degree of that, that denominator. So this tells us, if you go back to this problem, so it's kind of like the degree of the, nu of the numerator on top should be less than the thing at the bottom, right? And it has no, no slant asymptote. Well, because of that case, of course, it does not have any slant asymptote. So those are the information I can get, okay? Um, now I just want, well, of course, you need to multiply the whole thing by some constant. It can always just, you can always put some constant in front of that. By far, this is what I get from studying this, okay? From studying this. Now, another thing is I want to look at this, what I mentioned about, if you look at the behavior of this X near that X in intercept two, your function does not change sign when it passes through two. So that tells you this power has to be like an even power. So when you go to the right or left of two, it behaves like, like the parabola won't change that. So that tells me this one may be what you can, you can put two or four or six there but you can try to put the smallest one first. You can put the two. So on the top, you probably have like X minus two squared, okay? Now what else we can figure out? Now we need to put some exponents at minus four and X plus two. So what can we do there, okay? So because this is two, so you know either Y is positive, and so the degree at the bottom right here should be at least Three, right? Three. So you got to put a two here. One choice is two and one, or another choice will be C times X minus two squared over X minus four to the first power times X plus two. It doesn't matter which one you put, right? So we need to figure out the way to do that. Then the thing to study this is you need to look at the behavior when X is approaching four. See, look, if you look at this, line, this vertical asymptotes four. That means when X is approaching four from the left, from the left, it goes to positive infinity. When X approaching four from the right, 
your function also goes to positive infinity. So let's take a look. If you have this case, can it happen? If you, if you just put like x minus four to the first power, it cannot happen. Why? Because it doesn't matter x approaching from two to four to the left or right. So those two, this is a positive number because there's something squared. So when x is approaching four from the left, x minus four is approaching zero from the left, it's negative. When x is approaching, this is when x is approaching four from the left. When x is approaching four from the right, you have x minus four is going, to, they're going to be greater than four. So approaching zero from the right. So you have this thing positive, it will change sign. Okay, but when we're looking at this thing here, it doesn't matter what your C is, right? So it will change sign, but that violates the information what I get, they both go to positive infinity. So that tells me this X minus four, it cannot, you cannot put an odd power here. You, you can put X minus, uh, you can, you have to put a square or you can put a four, whatever, but the least the power you see, you can put the two of them. And the same reason, and when you see X is approaching two from the right left, it does go to negative infinity or positive, positive infinity. So this should, we should put an odd power there. So that gives me the reason why I'm going to set my f of x to be equal to c times x minus two squared over x minus four squared times x plus two. Now we need to determine what c is. We didn't use this piece of information yet. Uh, the y-intercept is equal to a half. So go back here, since we have, when you put a plug in zero for x, you have a half. So that's just a plug in zero. So when you plug in zero, you have zero minus two is minus two squared, that is four. Plug in zero for this, you have minus four squared, that's 16. Plug in zero for x there, that's two. So that's equal to four over 32, the C over um, 32, that's one eighth. So solve for that, C has to be equal to four. So with this, we just get my F of X looks like four times, this is one of the possible solutions, X minus two squared over X minus four squared times X plus, one, uh, plus two. So, I'm going to double check. Once I get this, I'm going to sketch this. See, I'm going to use my graphing calculator, see if I get this one right. So with this, I'm going to just uh, share my geo GeoGebra. Um, what I have, my function is, and I'm going to change that on the top just equal to four times x minus two squared. At the bottom, I have x plus two, uh, x minus the four squared times x plus two. So, this is the graph. So that's the graph. And I can also plot that x equal to two. Oh, no, no, x equal to four. That's the vertical asymptotes. And I have x equal to minus two. That's a not asymptote. So you see, this is the graph, what I got. And also I can, how am I going to do this? I'm, I'm going to, yeah, if you go back to my one note, can I, oh, hold on. This is the graph given, right? So I think the look pretty much the same, right? So this is how we solve this type of questions. So um, stop sharing that, go back to this thing here. Um, so this kind of problem is tricky, but it's, you just need to, be patient, study that clearly, get all the information, and the information tells you that the zeros or the vertical asymptotes tell you the factorization, 
and you just do trial and error, and you should be able to get that. So um, on Wednesday, we're going to continue on the last part, how to sketch that. Now, the other way around, I will give you a function. We try to sketch that by hand. With that, I'm going to try to con um, conclude, wrap up this chapter. We move to our final chapter of this course, uh, the logarithmic functions. Okay. Again, uh, exam three will be postponed to on um, a Friday, April 16th, right there. That's all for today. Any other questions? It's good. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. Can you open it up? On the quiz, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to infinity. Can you finish today? Yeah, I can do it today. I'm ready. I just want to go do it today and it wasn't open. So <laughs> I got your email. The thing is, I didn't, you know, yesterday I didn't, I didn't really know how to, you know, put it, you know, in words say, how am I going to grade your on the finals? I would say it depends on the performance of the class. I probably, I would do a curve. I typically I don't curve each exam, but I often gave like a big curve to the class in the end, when I got all the data, the performance of the whole class. I just okay. don't know what exactly it is now, you know, and yeah. Can, yeah. And that makes sense. yeah, and also as you mentioned about, you did put a lot of time and effort into this course, but you know, it's kind of like didn't see the grace, you know, yes, um, and really you see something paid off. I think this kind of frustration, maybe if I can call that, okay, it, it makes sense yeah. to, to, yeah. I would say the math course is kind of hard. It's kind of hard. It's just not made. We try to learn all this stuff in like maybe, I don't know, in 16, 15 weeks and doing this online and kind of challenging. Okay, so um, the only thing I can think of is just, you have to keep practicing. I have no idea. There's no certain, a shortcut, okay. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried yet. <laughs> um, but you said that we're doing our last, like we're learning our last thing next time. So like, what's kind of going to be like the schedule, like overall? Uh, we have a, a test next week. And then... Yeah, we're going to do uh, like um, stuff part of the log functions, logs, right? You heard of this natural logs, those things. Yeah. And then we're going to do like, you know, which is the very hard part. It's just like doing the graph. Now, what I did today in class is I gave you the graph of a rational function. You try to guess what's the equation with your formula, right? Yeah. Now, next time, what are we going to do if we're doing the opposite way? I'm going to give you the formula, the equation for a rational function. So you oh. need to sketch that by hand. Instead of using the GeoGebra or whatever graphing calculator, so you need to figure out the x, y intercepts, the horizontal, vertical, slant asymptotes, and uh, what else? Yeah, all this kind of where the function is positive or negative. And with all that given information, you are going to sketch the profile. So, okay. that, yeah, that's now with that, I I don't want to emphasize too much on that. Just spend maybe half of the class time. Then we're going to move to chapter six because we do have some other things like logs, exponentials to work with. Okay, perfect. Yeah, this, this part of the things I, I just don't know how the book, I really don't like the book. It's pretty hard. When you talk about um, polynomials, you talk about all this fundamental theorem of calculus. 
And it's really hard for me, you know, somehow to explain clearly why we want to do that. You know, it's you yeah. can put all this information all together. Why we want to do that? I think to me the key is you know the zeros, you know the factors. And if you know the factorization, that tells you a lot of information about this polynomial. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I always try to use that example. Uh, I learned tennis. I went to this uh, like a country club. There's clinics there just for us, like middle-aged people. Mm -hmm. We go there every Saturday. We do clinics, you know, just some drill, yeah. some gameplay. It's just hard. I've been playing that. I didn't know how to play tennis when I was young, so I missed that part. I started to learn that in like when I was like 40-ish something. I've been playing that for 10 years. I still suck. It's kind of like a frustration. <laughs> and the coach that says you got to put a lot of core time. Yeah, I, I did. I done. My buddies, we play, we practice a lot. We play like USTA leagues. I watched a YouTube video there and just couldn't, you know. Yeah. Couldn't get it. But at least one thing I know is I'm getting better and better each time playing. If I have not played for like a, for a month or uh, two, I didn't play well. Just I just know math probably may be the same thing. You got to put your hard work there. But it just it takes time. I just don't know how to say that. It's just yeah. It just, okay. Well, yeah. I'll keep working on it. <laughs> yeah. I would. So one thing I can say, I don't know. One thing I really, I'm not saying mad or what. I'm mad about like the, the math education in the states. It happens to my son. You know, I saw. You know, the, the math, the uh, algebra, or whatever teaching the education. You know, in the grade school. It was really bad. They, my son, I remember, is a really bad textbook. It's called a Saxon's Mass. I'm not sure you have seen that. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, just like stupid questions. You repeat every time. <laughs> and the teacher didn't tell the kid how to think, you know. Yeah. And in high school, then my son told me a lot of the kids there, they only took math or algebra for one or two years, right? Then mm -hmm. they didn't even touch that. They can just like a junior or senior. They don't need even to take touch any mass class or something like that. With all that, you know, I think something should be blended well with that. It's just tough. It's tough. Yeah, that's. It's not that's like like the social science, like a history. Oh, I watch my son doing maybe like a government or those classes and they. You don't really need to think, in my opinion, maybe I was wrong. You just need to, you know, go online, search something, memorize something, write the term paper, whatever, then boom, you pass. Math is just different. So I, it really is. So I like you put a lot of work. The only thing is I just would say, you just don't give up. Just hang on there. Just keep doing that. And somehow you can, the more you practice, then you figure this out. And I, and I don't know how many problems you have been doing that, you know. If you, you have to do like each section to do like 10 or 20. If you think, oh, can I just do one or two problems, then I know what this will be. For math class, it will be hard. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I will take the quiz and see how that goes and see if I know that Let stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, the class, the average is not, it's just 10 out of 20, so. Do you average the quizzes too? I, I, I typically, I just leave the, the score as it is, okay? And then in the end, you know, probably like say, if passing the class is 65 to get a C minus, I maybe I lower the bar a lot. I do curving like that. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, so. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. Yep. Okay, have a good one. You too, thanks. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.